Hello and welcome everyone to another Sales Hacker webinar. Uh, I can see everyone sort of trickling in now. Uh, this is a big one. We had almost uh, a thousand people register for this one. So uh, always fun when you get a lot of people with us. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic conversation. What we're talking about is sell the way you buy using modern sales science and empathy to grow your sales. And uh, I feel like this has been a long time coming. Um, I am joined uh, by our esteemed guest, David Creamer. David, welcome, man. Oh, great to be with you here, Scott. Coast to coast in Canada, as they say on Hockey Night in Canada. Here we are. Great to be with you. Absolutely. <laughs> we got Vancouver all the way to where, where was it again? I'm in Muskoka, so a couple hours north of Toronto. Nice. Yeah. Beautiful. And I was saying before this, it truly looks like the zoom cabin background feature but this is the real real cabin david it's the real us. thing look i'm like i can move it around there's like actually you know there's <laughs> there's real stuff going on. there's like antlers if you want to you know I for those of you that. i'm on vacation this was like <laughs> this was not, not planned weeks and months ago but i'm dialing in on uh, on the rural wi-fi it's holding up so uh so yeah no, great great to make it happen for sure i love it and Super quick housekeeping before I give the reins over and truly my job uh, today is just get out of the way because we've got a lot of media content to, to get through, uh, but super quick housekeeping. So these are all recorded. You always record sales hacker webinars. So if you have to jump off, uh, your dog is yelling at you, your kids need some help with their homework. There's are all slew of new challenges in this kind of work from home life. So if uh, you have to hop off, it's okay. We'll send this to you within 24 hours. Um, and then secondly, so this is going to be a presentation style webinar. So David's going to run through um, some great content, but it's always more enjoyable when we know who we're rocking with, who we're hanging out with. So if you can go down to the chat feature, uh, introduce yourself, your name, your title, uh, what company you're at. Uh, it's always nice. So it's not just feel like, you know, we're chatting. And if you do have questions, we're going to try and leave some time at the end for Q&A. Again, we have a lot of content to get through, but we're going to do our best to uh, leave a little bit of time uh, for Q&A. Uh, there is a Q&A function at the bottom. Please use that, and I'll kind of moderate that one um, at the end, and we'll do some rapid-fire questions. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to be quiet now and hand the reins over to David uh, <laughs> to take it away. All right. No, thanks so much, Scott. And it's great to be with you all here today. I see more and more people trickling in. So we, you know, by all means, keep you know, take a seat. Um, you know, I was saying to, to Scott before, I always believe in providing a lot of value for money in, in I guess, whatever content I put out. So there's going to be a lot of concepts that we're going to cover today. But don't worry, I'm going to lay a whole bunch of, uh, you know, links and, and things that you can refer to afterwards. And then we, of course, will have the recording. So don't worry about remembering all of it. But hopefully, there's going to be a few concepts to kind of just, you know, kind of like tickle your brain a little bit that encourage you to go and follow up and, and do a bit more research. So with that said, let's jump in. Now, you know, I often talk about people always ask me, you know, well, David, like, well, what do you do? And like, how, when did you get into, when did you get into sales? And, you know, I always say that I got into sales by accident, just like everyone else. Like everyone has a story for how they got into sales. And I am absolutely no different. Uh, I got into sales at the turn of the dot com boom. Where uh, So around 1999, 2000, and I joined a startup at that time, but I actually started my career doing something a little different. So here, I'm going to show you here. I'm going to share the deck. Hopefully everyone can see the deck here. I'm going to show you a picture of like the pre-sales David, but I'm only going to put it up. You can't, there's certain things in life you can't unsee. So I'm only going to put it up for like a few seconds because it's it's pretty it's pretty something. Okay, so here me here I am, the 1997 version of David. I was actually a research scientist before I got into sales at the turn of the dot com boom. So this is me with the hair and the glasses and the whole thing. Um, you know, my research scientist days, lab where I used to work, but got into sales by accident, like I said. And and the journey I'm going to black that out. So now you're just focused on me again. Um, I got <laughs> got into sales. Actually, I became a solution engineer, sales engineer. It was my first sales job. And absolutely fell in love with sales. And over the course of the kind of the next 20 years, I spent my time across four high growth tech companies, startups, 
Uh, three of those startups ended up getting acquired. One, which I helped start in 2008, was acquired by Salesforce. And I came over with the shift to Salesforce and spent five awesome years there seeing how the sales machines were built kind of operationally and, uh, and, uh, and culturally at scale. And after all of this time, you know, there's a lot of questions, of course, as a research scientist, I was always very curious. So a lot of questions I kind of wrestled with over the course of time. And I want to ask you this question now. And I'm going to ask you this question, and I'm going to launch a little poll, and I want you to answer it. Now, this is not a loaded question. This is just, I want your honest, honest feedback, okay? And so here's the question that I wrestled with that I want you to answer. And the question is this, do you like talking to salespeople? I'm going to launch this poll here now. And so hopefully everyone can see it. I want you to go in and vote. This is a completely anonymous poll, right? So you can feel free to say whatever you, no one's, no one's watching in your company is not checking on what you're saying here. And we got we got a lot of uh, got a lot of responses coming in. We got sixty five percent of people who have voted. Seventy percent. We're gonna have to cut it off soon. I think we've reached the. Oh no, people are still trickling. Okay, so I think statistically we have a lot of people on this uh, webinar. Statistically, I think we have a valid result. I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna show you what the results are. Oh, there's still people. Okay, you got to get your votes in now. Okay, we got it for the purposes of time. We got to end it. So. I want to show you what the results are. So 70% of you said that you don't like talking to salespeople. Now, I'm going to assume that most of you out there who are listening are in sales. Okay. Now, look, I've asked this question. The reason I ask this, I ask this question a lot. It's something I've kind of wrestled with, struggled with. I ask it a lot. And, and these results are actually quite consistent with what I see kind of across the board. Now, for those of you who said you like talking to salespeople, no shame, no shame in saying that. You know, oftentimes when people say they like talking to salespeople, it's because there's kind of a professional curiosity, right? They say, well, I, I'm in sales. I like, I like seeing how other people do sales-related things, right? And you know, if you said that you were not one of these people that love talking to salespeople, you are not alone. So Dan Pink, I'm going to drop a lot of books and, and some, some stuff on you. Like I said, you can, you can find all this stuff online. I try to leave links to everything. Some of my favorite sales books, and this is one of them, Dan Pink's To Sell as Human. And in To Sell as Human, he asked people, he said, you know, what's the first word that comes to mind when I use the word sales or selling? And he took all of those answers and he made a little bit of a word cloud out of them. I'm going to show you the word cloud. Now, keep in mind that the size of the word in the word cloud is consistent with, with the frequency with which that word appears in the results. OK, so 80 percent visceral negative feedback. Right. And, you know, and I, I say this to say, look, I love sales so much and I and I love all of you and I, I want us to do it the right way. But to your customers, like you are the enemy, right? Like you are the enemy. And oftentimes when, when you picture a salesperson in your head, when you, when you say, no, I don't like talking to salespeople, who do you picture, right? I want you to picture that person in your head. And I want you to tell me if the picture on the next slide and in any way encompasses that, okay? We got our buddy over here. Now, people typically picture this kind of sleazy used car salesperson. And this used car salesperson existed in a time where a certain element was afoot, which is referred to as information asymmetry. So information asymmetry means an imbalance, right? So this, the reason why you're, you're worried about talking to salespeople like this is because this person has a lot of information about the thing that they're selling and you have very little. So you go onto the used car lot and there's a, a car, it looks nice, it looks shiny, but it could be a piece of shit and you don't know, right? There's that imbalance there. Right. But also, you don't know how this person's compensated. You don't know what their motivations are. And so this information asymmetry gives rise to a certain amount of imbalance. And what's really interesting, though, that's not the old. That's a historical problem. One of the new problems is this idea of, of kind of what's the new enemy of sales? Well, it used to be back in the day and maybe even still in your organization, you were very curious to know about the competition. Right. The, the customers looking at us, they're looking at someone else. Maybe they're going to go with us, maybe someone else. You know, we need to know why we're better, differentiate, you know, how we price and so on. But the reality is the enemy today is not the competition. It is pure and simple attention. And I'm going to prove this to you in a second. But if you want to prove it empirically, I want you to go to your CRM. If you Salesforce, HubSpot, doesn't matter. I want you to go to your CRM and I want you to look at how many deals you lose. And hopefully, when you lose a deal, you keep track of the reason why you lost. And if you were to search your data banks and look at the reasons why you lost, the deals you lose to a competition versus like the dead, no decision, no opportunity, 
I'm willing to bet, and I have you know millions of dollars of data points from my Salesforce experience behind me, that you're losing way more deals, orders of magnitude to the do nothing than the competition. And one of the reasons for this is that there's just so many solutions on the market. I don't care what space you're in. A lot of people have seen this before. This is the marketing technology landscape slide. 2011, there were 150 vendors in the marketing technology landscape alone. Fast forward, 2000, and I want you to think in your head, 2020, this comes out in April of every year, okay? 2020, how many vendors are there? Over 8,000 vendors, okay? Lots of categories. And so if you tell me, oh, you know, we're this vendor, point anywhere on this map, and say, oh, we're, we're this vendor here, and this is what we do really well, your customers are saying, hold on a second, there's another vendor who came in, said, oh, like, you know, we, we sound very similar to this other vendor over here. And, and you say to yourself, well, no, 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 we do this really well, and that vendor does this really well. And the customer doesn't give a shit, right? Because they're too busy focused on their business. They're too busy focused on other things, and rightly so. And so what happens is you end up drowning in what we refer to as the sea of sameness, right? To the, to the, to the, to the customer, you just all just kind of sound the same right? The way you speak about what it is you do. This though is another challenge. This is an article and by all means, you can Google it. You can take a look at the link. This is an article I wrote for Harvard Business over a year ago. And, and it speaks to another big problem that exists in the world today, which is younger salespeople trying to convert older, more experienced buyers whose job they've never done. And I had this uh, kind of punctuated for me. So back at Salesforce, I used to run small business sales for the Eastern U.S. So I had teams in all different cities and my reps in New York City. So shout out to New York City. All of my reps in New York City by far had the most hustle. They made the most calls, the most emails and so on. But what's really interesting is that oftentimes I would have a rep that would have quite a large number of emails and activities and phone calls, but not a lot of pipeline. And, you know, I'd ask the rep and I would say like, so what's going on? You're not calling at the right time. You're not calling the right people. You know, not enough white space in the account. And they'd be like, no, everything's okay on that front. And, and the only recourse I had was to listen to their phone calls. So I would listen to a whole bunch of call recordings and I'm sitting there listening to their call recordings. And I'm thinking to myself, just listening, close my eyes. I don't even care about the words. Okay. I don't care about the words. I'm just listening to the tone. And I'm saying to myself, it sounds to me like, like you're bothering them. Like it sounds like you're afraid that you're bothering them because you can't add enough value. You're thinking to yourself, who the hell am I? I'm a BDR, I'm an SDR, I'm an A, it doesn't matter. I, don't, I haven't done this person's job before and I'm trying to like convert them. And it's manifesting in your voice, in your tone. And I talk about this all the time. You know, I have three kids and here on vacation, my three kids. When my three kids come to me and they're about to ask me, hit me up for something, I can tell immediately right? Just by their tone of voice, right? And so when you're trying to convince an older, more experienced buyer whose job you've never done, this gets manifested. I call this experience asymmetry, right? And this is something you can definitely overcome, but this is a real problem as the average age and tenure of a rep decreases, which it has over the last number of years. And so we typically like to solve this problem by God bless product marketing. I don't know if there's any product marketers on the phone here, but God bless them. We go back to product marketing and we say to ourselves, we say to product marketing, tell us why we're so awesome, right? We need to change up our pitch. We need to change up our motion here. And so product marketing comes back and they say, okay, well, we got version 3.0 coming out and 3.0 has all of these features and functions and all this awesome stuff, right? And what happens is when we go and we lead with these things to our customers, we get like the Heisman, right? They're like, hey, easy there, fella. I don't give a shit about what you have to say. I don't want to hear the pitch. And people are very sensitive to being pitched. So for example, if you get telemarketer calls, which I know a lot of us do, ask yourself, how long does it take you to tell that the person calling you is a telemarketer and they're reading from a script, right? Like ask yourself that question, right? The reality is it's very easy for us to tell. And for many years, I actually thought that, you know, these were two different people. So I'm here, I'm a VP of sales. I've been a VP of sales four times. I go out there and I'm telling my reps, hustle, make the calls. There's never been a better time to buy. It's end of month, end of quarter, which we are, you know, now we got like a few, a few days here to go before the end of the quarter. So I hope you're doing well. But I'm saying, I'm doing, I'm advocating for all these tactics, which are not unethical. They're not even categorically ineffective. But what happens, I go back to my desk, okay? And my phone is ringing off the hook and I got BDRs prospecting, prospecting into me because I'm like the prime target. And 
all of these things that I'm advocating for on in terms of tactics on my team are just not working on me, right? And so I had this epiphany that, you know what, these people who I think are actually quite different are actually the exact same, right? As sellers, we are all buyers. And the reason I don't answer my phone or respond to the LinkedIn invites is because I don't like talking to salespeople like you, right? Like most of you. And so I had this epiphany that we are the same person. And so I thought, I, you know, the, the kind of the mantra that kept resonating in my head is this concept of like, we have to sell the way we buy. Now, sell the way you buy doesn't mean, oh, you know, map the buyer's journey and figure out how to align with that. It's not, not exactly that, but it's kind of two things. It's number one, empathy, okay? Don't use tactics that wouldn't work on you. And I had this in spades. I would have reps come up to me all the time saying, hey, David, this customer has gone dark or we just had this meeting and I want to use this tactic, this email to kind of reinvigorate the conversation. And I want you to read it. Can you let me know what you think? And I would read these emails and I would look at them and I would say, would you, if you were the customer, would you respond to this? And they would kind of like smile. And I'm like, so why are we sending this to the customer, right? So there's a certain amount of empathy. But the second piece is this idea that as we buy, as purchasers, we are not often conscious of the mechanisms and pathways by which we make purchasing decisions, which was the most fascinating thing that I've learned in the last 20 years is like how people actually buy. So if selling the way you buy is actually really important, well, the question is, okay, well, well how do we buy, right? Like, let's, let's talk about this for a second so that we can align our sales motion accordingly. Now, I'm the chief sales scientist, so I want to run a little science experiment here. This is going to be the experiment, okay? I'm going to tell you a story, and I want you to, I'm going to, we're going to do a poll. I want you to vote, okay? So here's the story. Imagine we're back in a time where you can go on vacation again. Wouldn't that be nice? So now you save up your money, and you say to yourself, you know where, where I want to go? I want to go to Paris on my vacation. Now, if you're in Paris right now listening to this, then you're, you're, you know, you're steps ahead. But let's say you're here in North America. You want to go to Paris. So you save up a whole bunch of money. And you budget to go to Paris. And when you budgeted that money, you had $800 reserved to spend on your flight. You go online, you find like your favorite airline, and you find a flight that costs $800, right? And it's great. That's what you budgeted. That's the, all the money you have. You budgeted other things for that flight. Now, for that trip. Now, here's the thing. That flight, like I said, cost $800 when you booked it. But at the same time, when you were looking into flights, you found that there was a first class ticket to Paris from where you are. Now, this is not an actual representation of first class. I'm trying to, you know, it's more aspirational, right? So when you tried to book this ticket, the flight first class to Paris was $5,000. And you're like, that's out of my league. I can't even afford $5,000. Ridiculous, right? But something miraculous happens, okay? A few days before you're scheduled to go on your flight, you get an email from the airline saying, Scott, great news, right? You're going to Paris in a few days. How would you like to go to first go first class both ways? Uh, when you booked, I know the the, the 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 ticket was really expensive, but now if you want to go first class, you won't have to pay five thousand dollars. It's only going to cost you twelve hundred dollars. So you just need to come up with another four hundred dollars. So my question to you is: Here we go. I'm going to launch this as a poll. Do you spring for the upgrade? Right? Are you like hell yeah? I'm springing for the upgrade or nope, budget's a budget, man. And I, that's all I can afford. You tell me. We got votes coming in. I'm going, I'm going with it, David. I'm, I'm going first class both <laughs> ways, buddy. I don't want you to influence, but no, like this is like a legit question. Legit question. We got the votes are, are we got 65%. What do you do? Now keep in mind, like you don't have this extra $400, at least it's not budgeted. Right. So like, what do you do? OK, I'm going to I'm going to close off the last few votes are coming in and end the poll. And so here are the results. OK, 60 percent of you say you would spring for that first class flight to Paris. And this raises a really interesting point. OK, now you don't have this extra four hundred dollars. I don't know where you're getting it from or what story you told yourself in your head. Right. That you where you were getting this money from. But this is again, this is how you buy right? This is how you buy. And this is the big misnomer. We think that in the world of purchasing, especially in you know, B2C, B2B, doesn't matter, that we buy solutions to problems. And the reality is we don't. We buy one thing first and foremost, which is feelings. We always buy feelings 100% of the time. And this leads to a concept that I talk about 
called the solution fit paradox, which is like, ask yourself when a customer goes through a sales cycle to buy your solution, okay? And they reach the end of that sales cycle. They buy your product, they buy competitive products, or they do nothing, okay? Ask yourself, what percentage of the time would you say that customer made the best decision for them? And I say best, I don't mean, you know, I don't mean, oh, well, it's 100% because they always felt like they make the best decision, okay? Bullshit. If you were Deloitte, you're auditing that decision, what percentage of the time would you say that customer made the best decision for them? I'll make this simpler for you. If I were to ask you to write down everything that you ate for lunch in the last month, and then I said, I'm going to take that list. I'm going to give it to your doctor. I'm going to ask your doctor, did this person, now Scott looks like a pretty healthy guy, so we're going to exclude him, but did this person eat the best thing for them for lunch, calorically, food groups, portion size? What's that number? Now, having asked this question to many people, I know that number, if I were to ask what the average is, the average is low. Okay, the average is low. Most of the time, customers do not buy the best fit solutions for them. We do not order and eat the best things for us for lunch. And you know this when you come home at the end of a hard day and you say to yourself, you know what I deserve? Okay, fill in that blank. You know what I deserve at the end of a, a long, hard day? Whatever you fill the blank in, it's nothing good. Okay, it's nothing good, I guarantee you, right? So we don't do these things. And this is the big misnomer that a lot of sellers and buy sellers have is that value and ROI are not the same thing. You know, as sellers, we're, we're conditioned to go out there and we're told, sell value, sell value, right? And really what we're telling our salespeople to do is sell ROI. Go to your customers and tell them that if they spend money with us, they're gonna either make more money as a result or save more money to the tune of an amount far greater than they're spending. That's what ROI is. But as we've just seen, people don't buy things for ROI. They buy things because they value them. You upgraded to the flight to Paris, 60% of you, with money you don't have. And why? So you could be more comfortable for a few hours out of your, of your week-long trip or two-week or month to Paris? That's ridiculous. Think about something you spend money on that another person would look at and say, what the hell is that all about? Why is Scott spending money on that? That's insane, right? We all have those things. And that's why value is really what gets people to move. And value could be discretionary. If I am about to lose my job because I, I'm the CIO of a company and there was a data breach at my company, all of a sudden, I'm really interested in your cybersecurity solution. I'm not really concerned as much about that ROI. Think about what's going now. We're, we're shooting this in the middle of the pandemic. I actually am forced to wonder all of these governments and hospitals buying PPE and gowns and masks. Are they getting the best deal or what do they value? They value getting that stuff in fast, okay? Value ROI, not the same thing. Now, ROI is a component of value. When you put together a business case that looks good with good assumptions, you've consulted the customer, it makes them feel good that you've done your homework, right? ROI is a component of value, but value is a much, much bigger thing. And customers will always choose vendors that align certainly tactically and strategically, like you need to solve the tactical problem the customer has, but they will always choose vendors that align with them emotionally, with their emotional needs, with their view of value. And this is actually not a new thing. I love this article and by all means, go feel free to check it out in Harvard Business, The New Science of Customer Emotions. They did this research study and they found that generally when customers buy things, they buy them for these 10 major feelings and emotions. Right, so everything from like you buy a new car to the restaurant you go to, to the clothes that you wear, whatever it is, when advertisers advertise to you with these kind of subtle emotional drivers. So you see like a car commercial, right? And it's got like attractive people throwing their musical instruments into the back of this car, going camping in the woods. You think to yourself, I wanna be like that person. Like that's the vision I have for my future self, right? Apple, Tesla, they all do this. The funny thing is, is that when you ask people, why did you buy that product? They cannot tell you. They don't say these things, okay? These are unspoken, these are subconscious, right? But when you advertise, when you market to people using these things, this is what actually converts. So now, as we think about, okay, well, how do we align our sales motion to this? I want you to think about how everything that you do in your sales motion provides this idea of clarity, right? If we're stuck in a sea of sameness and we need to break out, 
And we need to garner the attention of our customers because that's the new enemy. And we're trying to overcome that experience asymmetry. Then everything that we do needs to be like that armor piercing bullet into the brain of our customers. Because if it doesn't, they will completely ignore you and move on. And why? Because they don't like talking to salespeople and they spend a fraction of a percent of their time giving a shit about you and your product and your company. Okay. So you need to hit them hard with this clarity. Now, one of the concepts that I talk about is this idea of using speed as a weapon. Like you should really be refining all of your sales motions to, for that like instant understanding. And, you know, I want to talk about this in the context of here's like a simple problem just to kind of frame it up. Now, uh, I'm going to give you a word problem here. Okay. And I want you to think about what the answer to this word problem is. Maybe you've seen before. And if you have, great. I'm going to give it to you. I just want you to think for like two seconds. Okay. I don't want you to overthink it. This is, there's no test. Okay. What is the answer to this problem? Okay. Here's the problem. A ball and a bat costs a dollar ten. Okay. And the bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Take a moment. You can even, if you'd like, you can even pop it into the chat. How about that? Pop it into the chat. Tell us, what do you think? What's the answer? You know, take, take your time. Okay. Now look, here's the thing. I will tell you before I show you the answer, I actually stole this from one of my favorite, favorite thinking books, Thinking Fast, Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Um, Daniel Kahneman is a, a Nobel Prize winner, super smart. And he talks about this idea that in, in terms of how we think in our heads, we have kind of two systems of thought, like the fast thinking system, which is like automatic stereotypes, don't go down that dark alley in the middle of the night, all the way to kind of like the very methodical thinking process. You know, uh, So for example, if I said, what's two plus two, fast thinking. If I said, what's 97 times 43, like shit, okay, I gotta, I gotta think, I gotta sit down and think about that. And the idea is that now, first of all, what's the answer to this question? Most people, most people, when they, they have that kind of the first answer to the question, most people, 80% say 10 cents, okay? But 10 cents is the incorrect answer. And as some of you are putting in the chat here, the correct answer is five cents. Now, five cents is, is great as you think about it, maybe you write it down and figure it out. But 80% of people, when they get, they get hit with this problem, say 10 cents right off the bat. And why? Because this problem uses speed as a weapon, right? It says, okay, a ball and a bat cost $1.10. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Oh, 10 cents, 10 cents plus a dollar, dollar ten, boom, done. Okay, you're wrong. It would be 10 cents plus a dollar ten would be a dollar twenty. That's wrong. Five cents is the right answer. But why does this happen? It's because that is how you think. That's how everyone thinks, right? So Knowing that, I want to lay on you a few sales tactics, right? That you can leverage around this idea of like thinking fast and slow, this idea of like system one, just armor piercing bullet, okay? Science and empathy based sales tactics. The first one is I refer to it as the power of polarization. And this is great in terms of answering the question of like, what do you do? It's a question we get asked all the time, right? Like, what does your company do? What do you do? We get asked this question so much, we're almost desensitized to it. And oftentimes we start answering, we start giving very functional responses. Oh, I run a company that does this. I'm a sales rep for a software company that does that. We have a platform that does, no one cares, okay? No one cares what you do. And so the idea is how can we kind of get people to feel how we use it as a weapon? Now, I'm gonna give you an example here. Polarizing messages, when someone says what you do, the idea is whatever it is I say, you're gonna decide whether you're on one side of that argument or the other, okay? And either way, it's good. Now, I'm gonna show you, this is a web page from a, a company that does not exist anymore. This was my third startup that was acquired by Salesforce. Now, the company was called Ripple with a Y. And Ripple was a feedback, coaching, and recognition platform. And we would go out, when we would, people would say, well, what do you do? We would say, oh, like we're a feedback, coaching, and recognition platform. And they would say, well, that's nice, right? They would smile. And some people would be interested. Oh yeah, if they were looking for more feedback and coaching, they'd be like, great, tell me more about your solution. But most people didn't care. Now, when we dug a little deeper and we looked at our customers and we said, hold on a second. Okay, so you want more feedback, coaching, and recognition. Can I ask you a question? What are you doing today to get more feedback and coaching at work? And people would say, well, we have this thing called the annual performance review that we administer to give people feedback. 
And we said, well, how do people feel about that? And they said, people hate it. They hate the annual performance review. Now, there were a lot of reasons why that was the case, even now, it is, now today, even 10 years ago. But we said, you know what? I think we found our enemy here. We found our enemy. And so we go out, I'm going to show you this website. Don't go to it because it doesn't exist anymore. And it, we said, performance reviews don't work. This is the new way to engage and empower your team. And this immediately caught on. And why? Because we picked an enemy. And so what would happen is we would go to like HR conferences and, and these events and we would say, you know what? Performance reviews suck. And people would laugh for two reasons. Number one, they knew we were right and they agreed with us. It was like that knowing, ha ha, you're totally right giggle. And other people would laugh because they were afraid, right? Because they were afraid. They're like, hold on a second. Performance reviews are good. The reason why you don't like them is because you're not doing them right. If you did them right, they would work and you would, your team would like them. And by the way, it's my job to run the performance review of my company. So I'm kind of vested in this. And you know what we would say to those people? We would say, this is not for you. And it's okay, right? Because by definition, when you polarize an audience, you immediately help them understand whether you're on, they're on your side or the other side. So polarizing messages can be very, very powerful. And the trick behind polarizing messages is to pick an enemy. So we pick this enemy of performance reviews, right? But there's lots of things that make good enemies. Things like old outdated processes or systems, wasted time, money and resources, fear and risk, or even lack of visibility, right? So I can go to a company and I can say, hey, you know what? I speak to CIOs like you all the time. And what they tell me is they are scared to death. They see the rise in ransomware attacks all over the sector and they're afraid that they're gonna be next, right? We can help you with that. And you don't even know what I'm selling you, right? But what I've done is I've, I'm invoking an enemy, right? I can you know, certainly waste the time, money, resources. I work with VPs and sales like you all the time who tell me they struggle. When they go into their board meetings and they're called to task by the board, they are not able to defend what the hell is going on in their sales organization. I can help you with that. You don't even know what I'm selling, right? But I'm invoking these enemies and enemies are very emotional and enemies are very powerful and they help you not understand what I do to a tactical level, but they make you lean in and say, tell me more about it. what is it? Tell me more. This is really interesting, right? Which is what you need to do when it comes to describing what it is that you do. A really simple tactic you can use to describe what you do is just use the words love and hate in a sentence to describe what you do. For example, we realize that Ripple, people love feedback, but they hate performance reviews, right? Men. A lot of men love to dress well, but you know what they hate to do? I want you to complete the sentence in your head. Scott, what do you think? You look like a dapper guy. I don't know. Men love to dress well. What, what do they hate dress to well, do? Dress well, hate Scott? shopping. Hate shopping. But I love they to hate dress to well. shop, right? There you go. They love to dress. We hate to shop. And this was the, the, the tagline of, of Trunk Club, which is a company based in Chicago that was acquired by Nordstrom for a few hundred million dollars a number of years back, right? Men love to dress well, but they hate to shop. Um, you know, even, even um, you know, organizations that provide like email tracking, like outreach, right? Like they might say like, do you ever want to know what happens after you hit send, right? Like people love sending emails, but they hate, they hate not knowing what's happening with them on the other side, right? So you can use love, hate in a sentence to describe what you do. And the added benefit is the words love and hate themselves are very emotionally evocative words, right? So they can really resonate with your audience. So give that a try. I want you to think about like, who is the enemy of your solution? Lead with the enemy, not the solution, not the features. Again, people don't care about the features. Lead with the enemy. If you want to learn more about this, I filmed a video in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia, where Scott is right now, um, which you can check out on the YouTube channel. I'll give you, if you want to copy down the link, I know it's like a weird link, but I'll give you, it's just Cerebral Selling as the YouTube channel, so you can go check it out. But I have this video, by all means, you know, dive in and learn more. Now, the other thing I want to mention is that when it comes to creating contrast, the contrast should be really instantly relatable. If someone has to say, oh, I don't, I don't get it, can you explain a little bit more? Well, I, that's, it's, you've lost, okay? I, can you tell me again what you do? You've lost, okay? The, the contrast should be instantly relatable. I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a dog, or let's say, okay, you have a dog, okay? And you're going to the park and you see this sign. And the sign says, please pick up after your pet. And maybe you do, maybe you don't, right? There's no park rangers there watching you to make sure you're picking up after your pet that have the sign there to try to encourage you to do that. However, the sign I'm gonna show you now is more effective in terms of being able to motivate action, right? Children play here, please pick up. Now, it's not, the, the power of the sign is not because there's a diagram of someone 
literally bending over. Like I'm sure people, you know what to do to pick up your dog's crap, right? But like, think about what happens in your mind when you see this. And you probably agree that this sign is instantly more relatable. The question is why? Well, what's happening in your mind? Children play here. In our society, we are conditioned to protect children because children are innocent. I don't want my children or anyone's children playing in shit for that matter. So I should pick up after my dog. That's what's happening in your head in like in a split second that no one has to explain to you, right? That's what I mean by like thinking fast, right? The armor piercing bullet using speed as a weapon, right? So the question is, how can we create that contrast? And here's like a very interesting, uh, very interesting example. The, the, the key to contrast oftentimes is using data, right? So for example, if I said, um, you know, people love feedback, but 80% of millennials hate performance reviews or CIOs love security, but you know, 75% of CIOs who said that they felt their infrastructure was secure had a data breach within six months. I'm using data to make my argument more compelling. But here's like a really interesting mind melting concept. Okay, think about this. I have two jars in front of you here. In each jar, I have some white marbles and I have some red marbles. And I gave you the choice. You can pick whichever jar you want, and you're going to reach into that jar. And if you pick out a red marble, you win a million dollars, something really good. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you that in jar A, there are 10 marbles. One of those marbles is, what, is, is red. Okay. The red one is the, is the winning one. In jar B, there's 100 marbles, and eight of them are red. So here's my question to you. We're going to launch this as another poll. Okay. Well, actually, here, I, you know, uh, let's go back to the I'm back to the poll here. Okay, here's my question to you. Which jar do you pick from, A or B? Which jar, if I gave you the choice, would you like to dip your hand into? We got answers coming in, answers coming in. Now, it doesn't take a lot of math to figure out that the chances of winning in jar A are more. It's a 10% chance of winning. Jar B... 8% chance. So you'd have to be an idiot to want to pick jar B, right? And yet, I'm going to stop the polling here in a second and show you the answer. We have a critical mass of uh, responses. So what do they, what are, what are people, a quarter of you want to reach into jar B, which is insane, right? Why would you do that? It's not, you're not statistically more likely, but there's a reason. There's always a reason, right? Why do you want to reach into star jar B? The reason is a concept known as denominator neglect. Now, it's interesting, as I'll explain this in a second, when this experiment was actually carried out with like large scale, 30 to 40% of people pick B, right? Not because they can't do the math, because what happens is all you do is you start, now think about your, you know, your, your fractions. Jar A, one out of 10. Jar B, eight out of 100. All you're doing is you're looking at the one and you're looking at the eight and you're like eight better. I don't, even though statistically, I know it's worse. I like the idea that there's eight balls of red that I can pull out from that jar. And this concept is known as denominator neglect. It's when you look at the numerator, you don't give a crap about the denominator. Now, here's the thing. You're seeing this today play out in the pandemic world, right? So think about this. You know, again, uh, if I told you that in Italy, 5,000 people contracted the coronavirus, COVID-19, you're like, shit, 5,000, that's a lot. Of, I can picture 5,000 people. If I told you that in Italy, 0.005% of the population was infected with, with COVID-19, you'd be like, ah, no big deal, right? Those numbers are could be mathematically equivalent, but they are absolutely not processed the same way in your mind, right? And so this is the thing, when you're presenting data, the trick is the data needs to be instantly relatable, right? If I tell you it's 10% or 10 of 100, those are very different things. And in fact, when we, they've done experiments, for example, they've, they've, they've had like psychiatrists who they told the psychiatrists in, in, in psychiatric wards of hospitals, 10% of patients like Mrs. Jones, who we released, went on to commit a violent crime within a, within a, within a week. 10%, okay? Versus... 10 people out of every 100 that we released, like Mrs. Jones, went on to commit a violent crime within a week of releasing them. Same, same statistics. What happened when they looked at the, the percentage of psychiatrists that were actually holding back those patients? It was double 
in the second instance, right? Because the number, ten, the number 10 was much more instantly relatable. Now, here's the thing. I'm not here to tell you that it's always the percentage or always the absolute number, which is more compelling, but it is one or the other, right? So sometimes if you're going out there, for example, you might have a solution that saves your, com your customer's time, right? Like imagine your solution, it, let's say it automates something, it saves your customer's time. So you go to your customer and you say, hey, you know what, like you, you buy our solution, it's gonna save you like 10% of, of your time every single month, right? And they're like, okay, that's good. Versus if you went out and you said, if you, in, if you implement our solution, it's gonna save you 20 hours a month of time. Now those two numbers could be mathematically equivalent, but I can picture 20 hours. 10% of, I can't picture that, right? So you, what you need to do is you need to use the number that is gonna be most relevant for your audience. And sometimes if your business case is falling flat, it's because you picked the wrong one, right? Now again, YouTube video, where I talk a little bit about the use of data, as well as an uh, article on my blog where I talk about this exact concept in a little bit more details. If you need to brush up on it, explain it to someone else, by all means. But when you're creating that polarizing message, creating contrast, really important, use the right kind of numbers. Now, I want to talk about discovery for a second, okay? I call this empathetic discovery. And here's the thing when it comes to empathetic discovery, okay? As salespeople, as I said at the beginning, and you said, most of you do not like talking to salespeople, you're not a doctor, okay? What does that mean? When you go see your doctor or a doctor, the, the doctor is allowed to bombard you with all sorts of questions as soon as you come into the you know, examination room, deep personal questions, right? About your health, your background, whatever it is. And what happens? You answer, you answer truthfully, okay? As salespeople, we don't enjoy that level of disclosure from our customers. And so here's the thing. Oftentimes when we ask questions in a discovery, Scott, what's your budget for this project? Scott, who's gonna, what's the signing process? Can you sign this, Scott, right? What is the, you know, I'm asking you all these questions. And here's the thing, I love the budget question. When I ask Scott what his budget for his, this project is, or imagine I asked you what's your budget for this project. How much money do you make, Scott? How many sexual partners have you had, right? Like, all of these questions are questions that as I ask them, you think to yourself, why is he asking? And what's he gonna do with that information when I give it to him? So if I ask you, for example, what's your budget? The person, the customer is always wondering, hold on a second. If I say a number, is the salesperson now gonna change their number to you know, moderate it based on what I said? Are they gonna do something weird with it? If I, and they say, well, what's the signing process look like? Well, what's it, are they gonna start calling everyone in my company after I tell them? This is very serious stuff, right? And so people are always worried and wondering what we're gonna do with the data we give them. So one of the easiest ways to get customers to open up, this is like super, now look, there's a lot of tactics I teach around how to get customers to open up. This is one of the simplest, okay? When you're about to ask a contentious, or you after you ask a contentious question, just append your question with a very simple phrase. The reason I ask is because, Scott, I'm wondering what's your budget for this project? The reason I ask is because a lot of my clients haven't set aside budget for this kind of project and if that's you, no worries. Like I can help you create budget or put a case together. I'm just wondering why, right? I can say, hey, look, the you know, uh, what's the signing process look like, Scott, internally at your company? The reason I ask is because you mentioned that we needed to be live in three weeks from today. And, and I just want to kind of do a reverse timeline just to see, like, would we have enough time to even meet that timeline, right? So there's a lot of science behind why this tactic works really well. I won't go into it right now, but you'll find whenever you're about to ask a contentious question or even respond to an objection with a contentious answer, you wanna make sure that your customer does not interpret what you have to say in any kind of odd or nefarious or underhanded way. Because again, you're the enemy and you need to explain why you're asking. So the reason I ask is because, so imagine you have a, a secret, a real secret, like something that you know about yourself that someone else doesn't know. Ask yourself, what would it take for you to disclose that to the other person? What would they have to ask? And I actually go through an exercise when I do my trainings, I ask my clients, I say, you wonder how much money I make doing this? Ask me. And when I don't tell them, I say, okay, well, great. How would you get me to open up? This is one of the easiest ways. Like I would say, Scott, I'm curious, how much money do you make doing the sales hacker gig? You know, the reason I ask is because what you do looks freaking awesome. And I would love, when I'm done here with cerebral selling, I would love to do that. 
one day. But I, you know, I make good money. I don't want to take a pay cut. Am I taking a pay cut to do what you do, Scott? Right. It, now, all of a sudden, Scott feels more comfortable with why I'm asking and, and ultimately opening up. So super simple tactic. And the last tactic I want to leave you with is a really simple one, which is this idea of like using questions to drive commitment. So what do we mean by that? Well, there's lots of different ways that we can use questions in sales to drive emotional commitment. And one of the ways, this is an article I just posted a few weeks ago, which is how to pitch using questions. And to give you an example, if you go onto my website, what does my website say? You ever wonder why you don't like talking to salespeople? Now, why would I say that? I'm willing to bet that my audience, which is salespeople, don't like talking to people like themselves, which you've proved out at the beginning of this session here, right? And now you're probably wondering, hold on a second, I'm in sales. Why don't I like talking to salespeople? I love sales. And yet I don't like talking to salespeople. Now you're leaning in, you're saying, tell me more. That's not what we're going to talk about today. I'm just giving this to you if you want to kind of check it out. However, oftentimes in sales, we need to get commitment from our customers. For example, uh, we've scheduled a follow-up call or we've had a discovery and the customer says, I'm going to think about it, right? And we want to have that next step. The last thing we want is we want our customers to ghost on us, right? We want to make sure that they're committed at least to getting back to us if there's a problem or challenge. And one of the best examples of using questions to drive commitment comes from an article in the New York Times um, that referenced, this was in 1997. It was a, little, as a study on a, a restaurant in Chicago that was losing $900,000 a year on no-shows, right? So you, you book a reservation at a restaurant, they hold your reservation, they have your table waiting, you don't show up, and it costs them a whole bunch of money. And so when they looked at, well, how are we getting people to get back to us? What are we asking people to do if their plans change? Because obviously, they made a reservation and their plans change. Now what do we do? So they looked at what they were doing, and they were making an ask. They were saying to people, hey, please call us if you change your plans. You know, you made a reservation, Please call us to be change your plans. And what do they find? No show rate, 30%. No show rate was 30%. So what do they do? They change that, that, that statement to a question. Will you call us if you change your plans? What happened? No show rate drops to 10%. And why does this happen? There's a lot of complex science that goes behind the scenes. So I don't have time to get into all of it here. But the idea is when I ask you a question and you say yes, right? And you say, yes, I will do that. I will let you know if you're planning. For example, okay, you're in the sales call. You have a next step with a meeting with a customer that's like next week, right? And you set the time, like, great. Scott, if for whatever reason you can't make that time next week, will you call me and let me know or just shoot me an email? When you say yes, something magical kicks off in your mind. It's actually a, a concept called cognitive dissonance. And the idea is that people need to behave in a manner that is consistent with their stated opinions and beliefs. So if I tell you that I will do something, okay, unless I'm a pathological liar, and then I decide later on not to, right? My plans change, and now I'm like, I'm like shoot, I can't make the meeting with Scott. Should I call him? I'm like, well, shoot, I said I would. I said I would because what ha what's happening? It's like a it's like a tug of war between your emotions and your ego and what you said. And human beings always need to reduce that level of cognitive dissonance. We always need to shorten that gap. We need to behave and act according to how we say we will. So if I tell you that I'm going to call you and your plans change, and they will. And, and I do, then I'm more committed to it. It's no surprise. So for example, when, I, when people reach out to me and they say, hey, David, I bought your book. I love the book. Um, I'm excited to read it. Instead of saying, hey, let me know, like, uh, you know, let me know what you think once you're done. Right? I'd love to hear. I say, once you're done, will you, let me, will you reach back out and let me know what you think? I'd love to hear. And they say yes. And then they do. Right? I don't do that by accident. Right? Everything that you're doing in your sales motion is impacting the level of engagement that your customers are giving you, whether you're doing it consciously or unconsciously. Part of this idea of sell the way you buy is to start being conscious of the pathways by which you make purchasing decisions. And I mean, I mean purchasing, not just like the final, you know, hey, I'm gonna buy this thing, but I'm gonna get back to this rep. I'm gonna lean in and I'm gonna say, tell me more. I'm gonna take the demo. I'm gonna let them introduce me to the next step in that process, right? So commitment, very, very powerful. So. In summary, we're wrapping up here. In summary, and I'm gonna lay a bunch of resources on you. What did we talk about? We talked about how the, the new attention, the, and the new enemy of your modern sales engine is attention, right? Customers are more distracted. Customers like you, by the way, are more distracted than ever before. So many solutions on the market, right? And so we need to make sure that we grab their attention. Value and ROI, we buy feelings before logic, 
right? So the idea is like, find out what it is they value, use speed as a weapon, lead with their enemies to create the right contrast. When you're asking for contentious information, provide reasons why you're asking and use questions to gain commitment. Now, if you're looking for tons of helpful resources, I give away everything for free, pretty much on my website. You can go to cerebralselling.com. You can sort the blog based on uh, topic and category. So you can, by all means, check out all that stuff. The YouTube channel is also organized by, uh, by playlist, by topic. So if you just want the messaging, the discovery, the objection handling videos, by all means, you can subscribe to both if you like. And then, of course, super excited about my book. Came out in April. What a, what a time to release a book <laughs> that you spent a year and a half writing in the middle of the pandemic. But super excited. The reception has been awesome. I just finished recording the audiobook. So it'll be coming out hopefully in the kind of September timeframe. But uh, the book's done awesome and just super excited by the feedback. I do this because, like you, I love sales so much. It's, it's what's given me, you know, everything I have, happiness, fulfillment, everything in the last 20 years. But it bothers me that when you tell someone you're in sales, you're, you're the enemy. And the way we change that is becoming more conscious of the pathways by which we make these purchasing decisions so we can be the kinds of salespeople that our customers actually love talking to. So by all means, check out all the free resources, check out all the book, uh, the books, the book there. Um, want to thank you for your time. And, and by all means, let's open it up for, for questions. Let's do it. David, thank you so much, first off. Uh, there was so much in there. And uh, I know personally, I have like a ton of questions. So I'm going to steal the first question because this is something um, that I get uh, asked a lot by young, young sellers. Um, and I think you put it in such a, a great way, this experience asymmetry. I think it's a huge problem in in, uh, in selling today. Uh, young sellers always come to me like, hey, like I'm trying to drive huge digital transformation across organizations and I'm three years out of college. And as much as I know what I'm doing, I, I feel like people don't uh, maybe take me seriously. What are some tactics that you coach people um, to to get ahead of that, get ahead of this kind of, experience asymmetry yeah well look there's a few things and by all means like I, all the free articles have have all this content but there's a few things number one you know i talk about this this concept of like knowing the customers what knowing what's in the customer's head enough to kind of read their minds and it, and articulate those pains back to them so i don't care if you're like on day one of your job if you know that you're talking to a vp of sales know what that vp of sales in general what vps of sales care about right like it's the lingo. It's the pains. Hey, look, I talk to VPs like, of sales like you all the time. And what they tell me is, you know, sometimes they go into board meetings and they're unable to defend like the, the, the impact of their tactics, right? Like knowing what's in their mind well enough and articulating it with passion and conviction is step one. Number two uh, is to think about like, who does the credibility belong to? So for example, we oftentimes in sales fall back into I phrasing, like I feel, I found what I've seen. Okay. And the reality is if you if you're like been in sales for a long time or you've been at your company for a long time, that might carry some weight. If you're the founder, great. But if you're brand new to sales or new to your company, no one gives a shit what you think. You don't you have no credibility, right? But who has credibility? Third party resources, studies and reputable, you know, uh, journals, um, your customers, the collective experience of your organization. So for example, you might say, Hey, you know what, Sales Hacker, we've been doing this for the past 10 years. And one of the things that we found is you can say that on day one, you know, you, you just started working or, you know, so, so you know, uh, Gartner found that this, that. So invoking the credibility of other people and knowing what's on the mind of your customer and being able to invoke that conviction is, is, is like most of the way there to overcoming that imbalance. Mm -hmm. Fantastic advice. You can almost borrow credibility from you know, other, other sources to get you there until over time, you will build that, that own credibility. I love that. Um, all right. I'm just going to keep these going, man. If you're, if you're with me, uh, Ash has a great question. Um, yeah. He, he wants to know about, uh, where does opportunity cost come in? Is what I avoid better than the ROI I gain sometimes? Yes, this is great. So I actually talk a lot about this in the book and, and I've stolen this from Daniel Kahneman. This idea of, you know, do you love to win or do you hate to lose, right? This idea like, is there something bad that's happening now that I want to, I want to go away? Or is there like some kind of future ROI that if I do this now, there's going to be a benefit later on, okay? The science is in, and the science says that people do things 
to a much greater extent to avert a loss than achieve a gain. And the example, you know, for there's lots of examples. You actually see this in, for example, pharmaceutical sales. Pharmaceutical sales in the U.S. outstrip vitamin sales by like 15 to 20 to 1. It, like 15 to 1, 15 or 20 to 1, right, in terms of revenue. So there's like a huge disparity. But like, ask yourself this. If you went to the casino and you were, you pulled the slot machine, you won 100 bucks. You feel pretty good, okay? Then you go to, you go to the casino the next night, you pull the slot machine, you lose 100 bucks. Which feels worse or better, right? Like, which, which feeling is, is more intense? It's the losing. People hate to lose. So I like this idea of, you know, positioning what it is you have to say in the context of, uh, of like the pain that the customer is experiencing today, right? Opportunity cost, well, if you don't invest in this stock, you're gonna miss out on the big gain later on, is not as compelling as the big problem they're experiencing today, which you can help take away. Hope that, Ash, hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. I think that was, that was great. I'm gonna sneak one last question in, and there is tons of great questions. Thank you, as always, Sales Hacker Community for being so engaged and really thoughtful questions. Do connect with uh, David on, on LinkedIn. Uh, check out everything. A lot of the answers uh, can be found on shrewdbrillselling.com. Uh, this last one. So we talked about the sea of sameness, right? You, you talked about that at the beginning. Um, and this is basically what Robert's uh, question is. What's the best way to differentiate yourself in a really, really crowded space? Uh, in this case, he's in the SEO space, which is hyper, hyper competitive. Yeah. So here again, like here's the thing. You have to get really intimate with the enemy that your customer is experiencing. So the enemy, for example, it could be low conversion, right? They're like, oh, like I'm trying to put all this content there, but I'm getting shitty conversion, okay? Now you might think to yourself, that might be the enemy, but you might need to go a level deeper. And you know why? Because everyone who sells SEO says the same thing, right? So think about like, why don't people invest in SEO? Maybe they're afraid that they're gonna get it wrong, right? Maybe they're afraid that their investment is gonna be a waste of money because they spoke to a friend who invested in SEO and they just said, oh my gosh, we just threw like 10 grand a month down the toilet, okay? So you might lead with a different enemy that's differentiated. You might talk about things like, for example, like we help companies you know, take advantage of SEO who have, who have historically struggled to see the value, right? And so now you're going to reach a different audience. You're not trying to reach an audience who wants to increase their conversion rates. You're trying to increase, you're trying to get to an audience who has struggled. So for example, even you see this in the diet and exercise space. If I told you that I have a program specifically designed for people who have tried everything to lose weight and get in shape and have failed, okay? That is different than saying, oh, uh, you know, my program can help you get in the best shape of your life, right? So my advice to you is a great question is think about how can you go to a different enemy or different space that your competitors aren't going in, right? To stand out from the crowd. Mm -hmm. I think that's such an interesting way to do it and play around with different enemies, right? And you're gonna attract different kind of personas. I think that's, that's awesome. Well, David, thank you so much. That is our time. Um, really, really happy that we finally made this happen. Thank you for doing it on short notice and from vacation. Please, uh, if you enjoyed this presentation, go grab this book. Heard nothing but good uh, things about it. And uh, David, get out there. Go jump in the lake. Enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, <laughs> thank you so much, man. Right on, Scott. Thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, wish you all the best. By all means, avail yourself of all the free stuff. And thanks for having me. Take care, everyone.